I wrote in my journal for chapter 16, life without Jesus is horrible. That's the whole chapter. Have you ever wondered what the world would be like without Jesus? And then I always, in my journal, I always think about that the book of Revelation is so evangelistic. So I wrote this. Perhaps you yourself are seeking but haven't found. You are considering but you haven't decided. You are looking but you haven't placed your heart's desire in Jesus Christ and willfully chosen to follow him. Well, if that's your situation, pay close attention to the 16th chapter of Revelation. It shows what your life is headed toward without Jesus. Now, I was a youth evangelist. I used to uh, enjoy traveling with a team, and we would preach, and when we weren't preaching to teenagers, middle schoolers, and high schoolers, we would go to the jails. I mean, I've done jail ministry. I've, I've been in so many uh, situations where the guards go, uh, 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 don't get, you're too close to the bars. They'll reach through. And, I mean, we don't even think of that. I mean, jail to us is what we see on TV. And I can remember when, when those men, when they finally start listening, uh, the, the prisons, of course, they only let us go into the men's prisons, uh, but when we would speak, at first they wouldn't listen. And then finally you would see the Lord working on different hearts. And it's totally different when they start listening. I mean, they turn toward you, and, and you can tell that they're processing what you're what you're saying. By the way, one of the largest uh, prisons in the world uh, is down in Louisiana, and it's phenomenal uh, what some of those associated with Word of Life have done down there, uh, speaking to thousands uh, behind bars, a captive audience, as they say. But this is the most graphic, vivid, and powerful description in the Bible of what hell will be like, okay? Now, we're going to see uh, people being cast in the lake of fire in chapter 20, but this is Jesus showing us. Okay, here, here is my summary of the whole chapter. Life apart from Jesus is nothing less than a living hell. In these 21 dramatic verses of chapter 16, John sees and records to mankind what happens when all of the wrath of God is, is funneled through the world in which we live, and it, and it just affects everything. And God wants us to see these seven bowls of his wrath are coming as the result for a world that rejects what only Jesus can give them. So let's, let's go through the bowls, and you can see them. The first bowl, a sore breaks out on everybody that has the mark of the beast. So either on their forehead or their right hand, that their head and hand starts, well, let me read it to you. It's even better than me describing it. Uh, then I heard a loud voice from the temple Remember, all the judgments flow from the holy presence of God. That's what the temple speaks of. So from the righteousness of God, from the justice of God, from all of the wrath of God, these pour out from the temple, saying to the seven angels, go and pour out the bowls. So think of these little shallow uh, kind of uh, super pasta bowls, and they're just going to walk up to the edge and go and dump them over. And so the first went and poured out the bowl upon the earth. And a foul and loathsome sore came upon men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. Wow. So all those people that pledged allegiance to the false Christ, sores break out on them. And that's horrible, loathsome sores. Verse three, it says, the second angel came and poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. Now, you notice we've gone from the trumpets, which were thirds. A third of all the creatures in the sea died. A third of all the green grass was burned. A third of all the trees were burned. Notice now, all those who worship his image and have the mark, verse 2, every living creature, all of the sea dies. Now that's saying life on earth is going to be not having a longevity. You understand that when the sea, did you know the phytoplankton, the, there is so much of our whole uh, atmospheric engine that is driven by three quarters of the surface of the earth being covered by water. 
And when three quarters of the earth simultaneously dies, wow, every living creature. Have you ever gone on the shore during red tide? Some of you live in Florida. Uh, when Bonnie and I speak down here uh, and, and our time off, I love to walk down the edge of the beach. Do you know when the red tide comes, when the, the poison is released and that those toxins start at the weakest living creature and it goes to the most complex. So the first thing you see is the, these little tiny uh, sea worms or whatever that live in the sand that you don't even know are there, they're all coming out of the sand and their little mouths are open. They're going, it's awful to watch. And they're, they're gasping. I mean, I didn't even know that those things lived down there. And they're half in the sand, half out, and there are varying lengths of them. Then all of a sudden, you start seeing fish that are washing up. And they're also, their mouths are open. They're gasping. And they are taking in these toxins, the, the uh, super bud of the, of the uh, red tide and that the toxins that that blooming produces kills them. But it kills them in order from the smallest to the biggest. And what's really bad, I mean down in uh, Naples area, when the, when the larger mammals start dying and washing ashore, it's horrible. Can you imagine that happening not on the shore of Florida, but the world? Number four. And the third angel poured out his bowl. So he walks out of this temple. They're coming uh, like the priests come out of the temple. And the angels come carrying the bowl. And this next one goes dump. And the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water. And they became blood. Reminiscent of Egypt. And I heard the angel of the waters. Angel of the waters. Remember yesterday, angels were giving skill and understanding we read uh, to Daniel, skill and understanding in chapter 9. So there are angels that give skill and understanding and wisdom and insight. Now we have an angel that, there's one angel that we've already met and we'll meet again that has to do with fire. There's this angel that has to do with water. And the angel that watches over water, because water is the essence of what we need for life. I mean, air and water, I mean, it's so important because we're so largely made up of water. So there's an angel that watches over that. You are righteous, O Lord. This is the angel of the waters. I mean, most people have never even heard of the angel of the waters. I mean, you are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and was and is to be, because you have judged these things, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it's their just due. And I heard another from the altar saying, even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. See what I said? This is the hard chapter in Revelation. People tolerate all that stuff in the Old Testament that Israel was doing because we say that's the Old Testament and that was an angry, wrathful God back there. But we have Jesus. Jesus who said, let the little children come unto me and he took them up in his arms and he was healing everybody and feeding everybody and Everybody that was sick, that got near him, got well. This is Jesus. Wrath, justice, giving them their just due. Um, for just a second, look back at chapter 2 of Revelation, verse 23, because I mentioned this yesterday. I want to show it to you again. This is what Jesus said to the church that was at Thyatira. I will kill her children with death, and the churches will all know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. Now, this is how I ended yesterday, and I want to begin here today. God gives everybody what they really want. How do we know that? Because that's what he does. But look how he puts it in verse 23. I search the hearts and minds, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. What are our works? Works are the things that we Think about for a long time, and we process in our mind, and when we're looking off in the distance, our minds are going, and there are things we want, and things we're going to do, and things we, we want to accomplish, or have, or say, or whatever, or experience, and we think about it, and finally, it goes from thoughts into actions, deeds, words. Those are our works. Now, sometimes they're good works, sacrificing for others, helping, sharing the gospel. I mean, what your guys are doing Getting ready for the campers is, a, is an amazing work. 
Uh, I mean, I was reading your calendar. Move desk one day, move, I don't remember all this, dressers another day, and then put the bunks in. Those are works, but look what it says. I will give to each one because I'm searching the hearts and minds according to their works. So God, look at, look at chapter uh, 16 now, verse 7. The Lord God Almighty is true and righteous, and his judgments on the people on earth with that third bowl. He said, you, you all have watched a countless number of believers in Jesus Christ be martyred. And some of you have even partic participated with it. And you are watching that go on. And you are either active or passive participants. So he said, now I'm righteous and just. I will give to you what you deserve. Then it doesn't stop there. The fourth bowl, uh, the angel poured out his bowl on the sun. Now, wait a minute. What's the context when we look at the book of Revelation? We're looking at the throne of God, which is the way it's portrayed in the Revelation is that the earth is right there in front of God's throne. So we're standing on this crystal, glassy sea, and there's this temple and the throne of God, and the angels walk to the edge of that, that glassy sea, and they can take their bowl, and right underneath them is earth. Now, I was talking to one of you uh, on the break last week, and you said, I mean, you said God sees the end from the beginning and all that stuff, and you were talking about, and they said, it's just hard for me to understand. I said, it's hard for me to understand, too. And so what I told them, and I'll tell all of you, I said that this, my Bible is like my ant farm when I was a little boy. When I was a little boy, my parents bought me an ant farm. It was about this big. It was just two pieces of plastic. I think it was glass back then. Uh, they, they, plastic wasn't as easy to get when I was a little boy. It was a rarity and expensive, but it was glass. So glass, glass, uh, you know, the frame, the frame all the way around, and then sand inside, and you got a packet of ants, and you dumped them in, or you went outdoors and dug up an anthill, put them in, put the little top in, and all of a sudden, overnight, your whole ant farm had a little honeycomb of passageways. And... I could have that on my desk, and, and I would have it with the window. I could see through it. I could see all the ants doing their thing. I would feed them, and they'd carry it down, and they'd feed the little eggs or larvae or whatever was down there, and, and they were always working. The ants never saw me. That's exactly the, the way we see the book of Revelation, that earth is down there. God is watching like an ant farm, everything that's going on, and he's looking at the thoughts and intentions of their hearts. He's watching all their works and deeds and everything else. And those angels, when they come out, they can pour right on the, the sea, the people that have the mark. But this one is different. See, now it adds a whole new dimension. It says, and the fourth angel poured his bowl on the sun. That means that the throne of God, actually, it's not just the earth there. The solar system is there. And that angel is, is actually affecting the thermonuclear fusion at the core of the sun. And look, look what happens. <laughs> Amazing. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of the God who has power over these plagues. So there's the response. God is saying, watch out, watch out. I'm sending this angel. You're supposed to repent. You're supposed to come to me. I made everything. I'm in charge of everything. I made you. And it says they get angry and blaspheme the name of God. Wow. Well, let's, and, and I could do the same thing, but you're already reading this, and so... That's the whole 16th chapter and that green block there when those frog-like demon spirits come out. And then God said, that's enough. Let's analyze. So my second uh, devotional thought from Revelation 16, life without Jesus is like having a deadly incurable cancer. Jesus said, I have sanctifying power. I'm the one who will cleanse and keep you. And again, I'm thinking of sharing the gospel. So I wrote, this isn't just turning over a new leaf. This isn't just making a promise you can't keep. Jesus wants to let, have us let him thoroughly change us from the inside out. That's what Christianity is. Christianity is the only thing you can share with someone 
And, and when I share the gospel or you share the gospel, it can actually come into someone and unlike other things, merely touch the physical body, it actually can enter inside of the part of them that's immaterial, that is infinite, that is eternal. It's the spiritual part. And the word of God can actually go through from the physical to transform the spiritual. That's what God can do. He can thoroughly change anyone who will call out to him, who will, will reach out to him. Remember Acts 17? Jesus said, if that's you, I am an arm's length away from you. I am close enough that all you have to do is reach out and you will get me. Boy, when you go on all of your, when you're here, those of you that are going to be counseling at the camp and those of you that go on missions trips and you're sharing the gospel anywhere in the world, you can look at that person and say, Jesus, this instant is close enough for you to grab. You can reach out to him. Actually, Paul says you can just reach out and you will feel and, and actually contact him. That's how Paul evangelized, to those pagan, idol-worshiping Athenians. Wow. Secondly, Jesus has life-giving power in verse 3. He's the one who gives abundant life. Remember John 10.10? 10? I'm come that you might have life, and not just life, life more abundant, overflowing. These three verses, God shows us that choosing to go through life without Jesus is like dying forever, the worst cancer, because it's the cancer of sin. My third thought is in verse 5. Only God is eternally self-sufficient and needing nothing. Have you ever thought about that? Satan needs God to allow him to continue to exist. So do all the one-third of the angels that followed him in the rebellion. So do the two-thirds of the angels that are the ones that are watching over us. So do we. Have you ever thought of how God looks at life? God counts time this way. In the book of Genesis, he says it seven times. In the evening and the morning were the first day. So how does God count time? To God, time, a new day, started last night. When you went to bed, God was starting the day. When you went unconscious, when I went unconscious, when we went unable to, to protect ourselves, that's what sleep is. It's so scary. That's why a lot of people can't sleep. They just can't imagine turning loose of everything. And so they've got to keep thinking about it, and they just keep thinking about it, and, and they never fully come to rest. But God says... When you can't keep yourself awake any longer, I start the day, and I get the whole day going, doing everything that needs to be done, and when you wake up, I'm already halfway through this new day, and you're supposed to check in with me and say, Lord, I've been out of it, I've been unconscious, I'm weak, I can't sustain myself, I have to sleep. You, who never slumber or sleep, have been running everything, and I'm checking back in with you what you want me to do. Wow. That's how God looks at time. Why? Because look at this. He is the only eternally self-sufficient, needing nothing person. Everything else, from all of the stars and the galaxies right down to us on this planet, all of us are winding down. You know the laws of thermodynamics. We're headed toward entropy, toward heat death, toward absolute zero, just everything stopping, apart from God continuing to cause us to consist. So God is eternal and independent. It's another reminder, as I told you in week one, that all 25 of our God's attributes are declared and illustrated in this one amazing book. That's why the early church loved this book. It has everything. It's the most complete picture of Jesus Christ in the Bible, and it's the most complete theology of God. All of his attributes are in this one book. Number four, my fourth observation, the ultimate and final global warming is dead ahead. I mean, you can't, we're walking into the place where we're staying and there's this big screen there and it seems like the weather channel is on 24-7 and when I walked by it yesterday night, I stopped with Bonnie and I looked and it actually named the airport where Bonnie and I fly into at the end of each one of our rounds of our mission trips. It's called DRO Durango and it had a big red band through it and it says, this is the high, severest drought of, you know, I don't know from when. Weather Channel doesn't tell everything. There aren't footnotes. But it was a red band over Durango, and it says, and then they started showing all the wildfires that are going on in New Mexico and everywhere else. Look at this. The ultimate final global warming, which, I mean, what they were talking about is there's a drought, like Mead is down, and the screen was showing all that. Can you imagine when this happens? God the Son, the creator of all, this time touches the sun. And instead of it going up, you know, 
like now, the, the temperature is going up point whatever degrees. He just takes the thermostat and goes, and look what it says. It says he scorches people. I mean, it's unbelievable. If it lasted long enough, this temp turn the Lord gives, the polar caps would melt, and the remaining humans left alive on earth would find few places to flee. If both polar caps melt simultaneously, do you realize how far inland the water would come? Do you remember how they all got to the polar caps? That's a result of the flood and the vast changes climactically in our earth. But it doesn't stop there. Life without Jesus is like dying of thirst. Uh, remember the angel pours the water on all the water, or the bowl on all the water? Jesus has satisfying power. He's the one that said you'll never thirst. But we thirst because of sin. And on John 7, 37 to 39, Jesus, on the last great day of the feast, stood and cried out and said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. The context of that is unbelievable. Jesus would go to Jerusalem on the feast. And this feast was one of the favorite feasts. Uh, it was commemorating the you know, Feast of Tabernacles. It was in October, late September and October. And Jesus would go up to Jerusalem with everybody else, and there would be hundreds of thousands of people crammed into the temple courtyard, the 40 acres of Herod's temple courtyard. And all the people would be standing there, and mothers would start going shh, shh, shh to their kids because the highest event of this feast was when the high priest himself would, would get a bowl of, well, actually a jug. It wasn't one of these bowls. It was a jug of water from down in the, the pool of Siloam, from the, the springs that ran out from underneath the Temple Mount. They would carry the water up. The high priest of the nation would climb up on this platform. He would stand at the top of the platform with hundreds of thousands of people watching, and he would take this jug, and he would reenact the water from the rock. And, oh, this was the top thing. Kids wanted to come to the feast because they, they loved this reenactment. They had already reenacted the pillar of fire, and they would at night light the entire 40 acres with giant menorahs. And so, I mean, it was a festive time, and all the Israelites, like in Jesus' time, liked to come and see all this. But this was the big one. And so everybody wanted to hear. He was like 20, 30 feet up in the air on this platform, and he was dumping about two gallons of water that would fall at 16 T squared, you know, the speed of things falling under gravity, heading down toward that pavement, and it would go faster and faster till that water would make this big splash, and they'd all think about God sending water from the rock. So everyone is quiet, and the priest is getting up the edge. He's tipping and I want to tell you what happened. Shh. Mothers are saying. Kids are breathless. On the last, the great day of the feast, as the priest was doing the highlight, dumping the water, Jesus stood. So he was with everybody else, quietly sitting there. The crowd was motionless. And right when the priest tipped that jug over, Jesus says, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me. What a moment. He spoke in that moment to more people than his whole ministry combined. He probably was heard by one to 200,000 people in one moment. And he said, If you come to me, boy, and it made all the, the religious leaders very mad, very mad. If you come to me, he who believes in me, the scripture says, this is what salvation is. Out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the spirit whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Wow. Living without Jesus is like dying of thirst. And he picked the most dramatic thing to demonstrate that. Life without Jesus is like being enslaved to the worst master. Uh, in verses 8 and 9 of chapter 16, it says, uh, the fourth angel poured the bowl on the sun and they were scorched. They had nowhere to go, yet they wouldn't repent of their sins. They were enslaved by that master. What Jesus says right after the event with the water, he says, 
Uh, in John 8, 31, 36, Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, so obviously, I mean, he had some results from his, come to me, if you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed. See, Jesus had a problem with people that had an initial quick reaction, they thought he was great, but then they went, oh, I'm not sure you're great. And you know what it says in John 6, 66? That's an easy verse to remember, 6, 66. Um, he says that, most of those who were following him stopped following him. Wow. But Jesus said, if you're the real thing, you'll abide in my word, you're my disciples, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And then he said, we're already Abraham's descendants. We've never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you'll make us free? And Jesus said, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son will make you free, you'll be free indeed. Wow. That's what Jesus offers. One day I was sitting preparing my Sunday message in my office when I heard a scuffle outside. My 90 or 85 year old secretary was out there. I could hear her bumping against my office door and I didn't know what was going on so I opened the door and my secretary, who was only about this tall, was holding back this, this black belt in judo special forces perfect muscle guy, I mean, trying to hold him back from coming in my office. The only problem was he was only wearing these little tiny uh, jogging shorts. That's all he had on. The rest of him was covered with sweat dripping off him. I knew who he was. I saw him. Every day, everybody in that town saw him. He had two, I don't know what they were, 10, 15, 20 pound, I don't know how much strong people can do with, with dumbbells, but he would power walk. He had some kind of a cadence that he did, his giant barbells, and he power walked all through the town. I don't think he had a job, because I saw him every day walking through town, and he would do that till his muscles just bulged everywhere, and, and he sweated profusely. So that's the guy. And he was pushing into my office, and I said, Kay, let him in. He obviously wants to talk to me. She said, but you're studying. I said, yeah, but I study to share the gospel with people, so let him in. So he comes in, sweating, sets his barbells down. He says, uh, and he told me his name. I said, I know who you are. I said, everybody in town knows you. I said, I've never met you. And he kept dripping on my carpet. I was thinking about that. I mean, he was actually dripping wet. And he said, I have one question for you. I said, what's your one question for me? He says, I walked through your parking lot. I said, you do walk through our parking lot. The church parking lot was on both sides of the road, the main road of that town. And he would power walk right through. You should have seen some of those mothers scared that their little kids would get mowed down as he power walked, you know, with his barbells. I said, yes. He said, when I walk through your parking lot, I feel something. I said, what do you feel? He said, peace. And he said, father. That's what he called me, father. That meant he was Roman Catholic, and I was a religious leader, so I had to be a priest or something. So he said, father, why, when I walk through your parking lot on Sunday morning, when you guys are going to church, do I feel peace? What was that? That was an invitation for me to what? Share the gospel. That's what he was asking. He was asking me why he could feel the presence of God that he didn't know personally when he was around Christians. And so I just started through uh, sharing the gospel with him. And I, I started in the Romans Road. And after I went a while, I was busily like I am up here with you reading like this. And I looked up and he was gone. I thought, when did he leave? I wonder where he left, what part bothered him. And then I moved my Bible a little bit. He was right down there on the floor. He had gotten down, sweat and all, and was on his hands and knees and had his forehead, kind of like you've ever seen someone, you know, on the, doing their prayers, you know, uh, where they get down on the carpets. He was just like that, just down on the floor. And I said, what, excuse me. I said, I was still sharing. He said, well, I'm ready. He said, I want it. I said, want what? He said, I want that. So I got down with him, and I, I finished sharing the gospel. It was a wonderful time. He said, I want the Lord. He, he told me his story. It was a terrible story of everything he did. He used to go to bars because he was a whatever degree black belt, and he would pick the most provocative woman at the bar that had a guy sitting next to her, and he'd come and sit in the chair and push the guy out from beside her, and, and start talking to her just to make the boyfriend or whatever the guy next to the girl was mad. 
And the guy next to the guy that got mad and pushed out would go, hey, and make a, like an advance toward him. That's what he was waiting for. Because in this state, if anybody starts a fight, you're not guilty if you finish it. So that state had this law that if in a bar someone started to fight you and you decked them, you, you couldn't be prosecuted. He loved doing that. He'd push all the girls, I mean, push the guys out, sit next to the girl, wait for the boyfriend to say, hey, and he would just decimate them. And he said, I always got the girl. That was his goal, get the girl. He said, that's my whole life. And he said, I get every girl I want all the time. And he says, I'm muscular. And he said, but I walk through your parking lot, and you have in your parking lot what I've never found in my life. So I led him to Christ, gave him a little paperback Bible, and said, here you go, this is a, a New Testament. I said, and you can start reading it and come to church on Sunday and I'll talk to you more. And I knew I could find him because that outfit, I, you see him everywhere. So he took his little paperback Bible and I couldn't believe that it was Wednesday. On Sunday he was there, fully dressed. I didn't even know he had clothes. And he was standing there and he came up to me with his paperback Bible. How long does it take to read the whole Bible? It's on your test and quiz. 72 hours. It only takes 18 to read the New Testament. So I know that he had read a lot that week. He said to me, standing in church on Sunday morning, with every, he drew a crowd. People were all going, that's the guy from the parking lot. I went, yeah, it's okay, just leave him alone. You know, he's finding his way here. He didn't know any of the rules. I mean, he just talked during the service. I mean, he was just a, a panic. So at the end, he comes to me and said, I found myself in the Bible. I said, you did? He said, yeah, in Titus. I said, what? He said, Titus. I'm in Titus. I said, Titus, yeah, okay, Titus. He said, I want to read it. For we ourselves were also foolish, disobedient, deceived, Serving, and his voice was huge, serving various lusts, deceived in pleasures, living in malice, envy, hateful, and hating one another. But then the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. And he just got all emotional, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. He caused a little revival in that church because the, the most outwardly unchristian person in town felt the love of Christ through the saints, was convicted of his sins, called in the name of the Lord, was tr transformed. And then when we baptized him at that you know, everywhere I've ever pastored, we always have the people in the tank with a microphone share how they came to Christ. And he just said, I was walking through your parking lot, and everyone was just tracking with him. They'd all seen the drips, you know. And he said, I felt the peace of God, so I went into the office. And, you know, the secretary wouldn't let me in, but then the father let me in. The father. And uh, it was so precious. That's the power of the gospel. And that's what we're sharing, and that you don't know what's going to happen when you share it with those campers and on your trips and everything else. By the way, I had to disciple him. Do you know what I pointed him toward? I mean, this guy had been every night at the bars, every night picking up the, the girl of his dreams. He had a lot of baggage, and he said, boy, I have all these. He said, I'm a Christian now. I want Christ, but he said, I have all this bad stuff. I said, yeah. And this is uh, online everywhere. This is John Piper's famous poem called Anthem. And it tells how you, how you overcome temptations that get ingrained in your life. You avoid the sights. You say no to every lustful thought. You turn your mind forcefully toward Christ, who's superior. That's Piper loves that. Superior satisfaction. You hold on to the promises and pleasures of Christ firmly in your mind and enjoy in that moment a superior satisfaction as you move into useful activity. And I actually discipled him in how to say, this is a long way of saying, say no to sin and yes to Christ. But, back to Revelation 16, people that are not like that power walker, look at verse 10. And the fifth angel poured his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. Wow. Jesus enlightens us. He gives us spiritual sight. 
Acts 26, 18 says the first thing that God does to every person you lead to Christ and the first thing that happened to every one of us when we called the name of the Lord is he opened our eyes. And for the first time, we can see and understand and see him clearly. Well, the next angel uh, in, in verse 12 pours the water on the river Euphrates and look at this, it says that gathered together everyone, verse 14, to the battle of the great day, verse 16, and the place they gathered together is called in Hebrew, what? Armageddon. There it is. I told you you'd become experts, and the world is very interested in Armageddon. There's where it first shows up, and Jesus uh, is going to come and conquer the world. Well, real quickly, let's talk about Armageddon. It's the most talked about thing in the Old Testament. Zechariah 12 to 14 is about it. It's all about God's wrath, Israel's future, and the world coming at Armageddon. Actually, what the Bible says in Zechariah is the tribulation is when all the nations of the earth turn against the Jews, and God calls them my people, and Jerusalem, that God calls my city. And this is what Zechariah says, the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations. And then it says, on that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives in front of Jerusalem. Why does God do all that? Because God has staked his name on Israel. Now, I'm not teaching the book of Hosea, but if you read Hosea 5.15, you'd see that. I'm not teaching Jeremiah, but God has made a covenant, an, a sovereign covenant, unbreakable covenant, that they are, the Jews are his chosen people of promise. So, if you read the Bible, you start noticing things. In Psalm 83, there's this huge battle that surrounds Israel and all these nations, and it lists off all the nations. Then when you read Ezekiel 38, it's even clearer. It says that one of the nations is Iran. And boy, that should ring bells, because that country is still, I mean, it's in the news. And the other one is, is where the Scythians are from. That always baffled me, you know, where the Scythians are from. And then I, I remember when I first taught in Russia, they honored, the church honored us by a trip to Moscow, and we went to the Kremlin, you know, the, the center of Russian uh, control of everything there, and the Kremlin has a museum in front of it, in Red Square, in, in that center of Moscow. Do you know what the first exhibit is at the Kremlin? The history of the Russian people starting at the steps, the plains that lead up toward the heartland of Russia where the Scythians live. And if you read Ezekiel 38 and 39, you understand that, that when it talks about all those names, it's talking about the people that are the tribes that became what we know as Russia today. Then you get to Daniel 11, and then you get to Revelation 16. Usually one picture is worth a thousand words. We have the 69 weeks you learned about in Daniel. We have the crucifixion of Christ and the destruction of the temple. That's called the interval. Then we have the final seven uh, years, which is the 70th week. Daniel said 70 weeks are declared for your people. Now look at this. We know for sure where the Battle of Armageddon is over here because it coincides with the second coming of Christ and the launch of the millennium. We also know when the Great Tribulation starts, which is on the, the fifth seal, which is the center point of the Tribulation, the center of the seventh week. We know the temple is already rebuilt by the middle. We don't know when it gets built. That's what the question mark and the dots are. But what we really don't know is when is Ezekiel 38 and 39? Is it, is it before the rapture? Is it right after the rapture? Is it the battle of Armageddon? So let's just look and see, and look at these passages. Psalm 83 is easy. This is the list of people that Psalm 83, 6 to 8 says attacks Israel. Moab, Hagarines, Gebal, Ammon, Amalek, Philistia, Tyrus, and Assyria. Those people never all lived at the same time. So this can't be something in the past. It says they come together. So then we have to look at, okay, Moab is where Palestinians and Central Jordanians live. Hagarines are from Hagar, from Egypt. Gabal would be what the region we would call Hezbollah, northern Lebanon. Uh, Ammon, again, that's the Palestinians and Jordanians. The Arabs of the Sinai area are Amalek. Philistia is where Hamas is right now. The, you know, the, the cities of the Gaza Strip. And then we come back to Tyre, that's right in the middle of Hezbollah, and Assyria is just Syria and North Iraq. So, hmm, 
that group right now would be interested in attacking Israel. So now we move to the Ezekiel 38 war. It's a little different. Ezekiel 38 talks about the, the great powers of the north coming down. The Scythians lived between the Caspian, Caspian and the Black Sea in that area. And so that's them coming down. And then we've got all these tribes that, that uh, are associated with Russia. Then there's Iran. Then it says all the kings of the south come up. And it names them. Uh, Cyrene, Ethiopia. So that's interesting. Then we look at the Armageddon coalition of Ezekiel 38 and 39, Ethiopia, Libya, Turkey is mentioned, Russia is mentioned, Iran is mentioned. And right now, all of those, except for Turkey and Ethiopia, are quite against Israel right now. And now you start looking at Bloomberg. If you know anything about business, it's the number one business service in the country. Bloomberg says, Russia in the end of days, uh, I added that, this is a Bloomberg map, they call it the new Cold War. Russia, Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, and Yemen are against the more, um, or the less radical parts of the Middle East. But now we get to where we are, and this is so different. The Antichrist leads the armies of the West. The kings of the South come in. The kings of the East come in. That's exactly the scenario that chapter 16, and we'll see more clearly in chapter 19, they join with the kings of the North. So what's the exact timing? The Lord doesn't make it clear. That would save hours. I see people that are endlessly debating this, and you know what? God is going to trigger this whenever he wants. But this is what he does. This is the trigger, verse 17. Then the seventh angel, remember we're still up there looking at the earth. The angel comes with that shallow bowl. He pours it over uh, his bowl into the air. A loud voice came out of the temple of heaven. It is done. There were noises and lightnings and there was a great earthquake and the great city, verse 19, was divided and the great Babylon was remembered. And look at verse 20. Every island fled away. Now look at this. The ultimate mega quake rumbles. Jerusalem is split. The Bible says every island and mountain start moving. Notice what it says, that, that uh, uh, verse 20, every island fled away and the mountains were not found. What's going on? God initiates the preparation for the millennium. God says the whole earth's going to be changed. So basically what we can say is life without Jesus is just like total fear. I mean, if every island moves, if every mountain moves, if there's a quake that big, if the sun is scorching you, if every water source, if the oceans are dead, it's just total fear. So what, what did the people, what were they supposed to think about that? Remember, this was written to seven churches. Well, Paul declared powerfully, what should we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He that did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? And what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? That's the word Paul used. Yet there are many believers that when they even hear about this going on, the first thing they think about is, how can I escape all this? I want to get away from it. Did you know what? We're supposed to be going toward these lost people while they will hear we're supposed to go toward the sweaty power walkers and everybody else in this world that need to know Jesus Christ. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. So, God lets everyone know what life without Jesus is like, and it's horrible. And he sprinkled in among them us who are Christ-loving, Bible-believing, gospel-sharing, hope-overflowing saints. And we say, yep, the world's getting worse, it's getting darker, it's heading toward destruction, but I'm not afraid because I know Jesus Christ. <laughs>